Welcome, Pastor, as he comes to bring the word today. Are you happy? Well, why don't you notify your face? Your face does not know you're happy yet. There's just not a lot of happy people. I'm going to be talking to you from Matthew chapter 5, the first 12 verses. Jesus saw the multitude. Let me set the scene. Jesus saw the multitudes. That was the onlookers. And now when I say happy, I'm not talking about tiptoeing through the tulips, drinking that sweet bubble up, meeting that rainbow stew. That's not what I'm talking about. He saw the multitudes, and he knew they were just onlookers. And he, he wanted to take the disciples aside, and he took them up the mountain, and he knew the onlookers wouldn't climb the mountain to hear what he had to say. They wouldn't make any effort to hear what he had to say. He took the disciples up the mountain and gave them a lesson on how to be happy, how to have a happy life. Now, understand, these first 12 verses deal with the Beatitudes, not platitudes. Platitude is just a trite remark or a trite saying. These are Beatitudes. They are laws to live by if you want to live a happy life. And they're called be, be attitudes because they are the attitudes that have to be active in your life if you're going to have a happy life. Now, God is not the cosmic killjoy. He did not design or create the long face. And he does not take great pleasure in people walking around with mully grubs all the time. I mean, face long enough to eat oats out of a stovepipe. That does not give him joy. God wants you to be happy because he made you the light of the world. And the world is not impressed by a bunch of grumpy, grouchy, long-faced people claiming to be Christians. If you're waiting in your life to where life has no problems, you don't have any problems, everything is great, you're not going to spend a lot of time being happy. Now, I've been asked several times in my lifetime, Mac, do you really take the Bible literally? My response is, do you take it seriously? There's a lot of people who take it literally that do not take it seriously because they do not apply its teachings to their own life. The kingdom of God is not a philosophy, church. It's a working principle for how to live a happy life under the rules that he lays down. God is real. Jesus is real, the Holy Spirit is real, the Bible's real. We've felt His touch. He's lifted our burdens, He's answered our prayers, He's mended our broken hearts, and He's walked with us through the valley of the shadow of death. And if you're saved, you're a Christian, you know that's true. Now, Jesus took the disciples up the mountain and left the multitudes of onlookers. The church world has a lot of onlookers today. They look at the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the Word, but they never apply the words to themselves. They're just onlookers. The Bible is not the book of the month, church. It's the book of the ages. Amen. 
And we need to take it not just literally, but we need to take it seriously. The word blessed is used nine times in the Beatitudes. Blessed means happy. So when you read it, say happy is the person. Jesus is teaching that happiness depends on character. It depends on who you are and what you are. Happiness does not depend on what you have. It depends on what you are. Yeah. Today, society looks at how beautiful a person is, how handsome they may be, if they have money, if they have popularity. But a lot of people who have all of those things are miserable. Some of the most miserable people on the planet are the people who have so much. And if you live in a three or four hundred thousand dollar house and you're miserable, what have you gained in life? What is the point? You're better off to live in a tar paper shack and be happy. Yeah. Not with what you have but what you are. Always remember, the devil works from the outside in. When he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, he started with an apple, and then he worked into disobedience. God works from the inside out. He fixes you on the inside. The new birth is God's way of dealing with human personality. Jesus gave the, the disciples a course on how to be happy. And I want to share with you just four rules. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth, and I'll promise I won't keep you too long and bore you too bad. Verses 3 and 5. This is the first rule. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, I tried to find one word that would wrap those three verses up. And the only word I could come out with is humility. Humble. God can use people who are humble. And the devil can ruin people by making them proud. Humility is a strange thing. When you think you have it, you just lost it. It's like the man in the church, they vote, the church voted that he should get a pen that he was the most humble man in the church. So they gave him this pen, and the next week they had to take it away from him because he wore it. <laughs> you may as well relax. Pride. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Humility is not weakness. Jesus was meek and lowly. When he was reviled, he reviled not. Striking back is easy. That's our human nature, to strike back, to get even, get revenge. Hebrews says Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. The promise, the cross gave redemption, not revenge. Satan was cast out of heaven because he became proud. And when the devil tempted Adam and Eve, 
He appealed to their pride. He said, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. Do you know what that meant? See, Adam and Eve did not know right from wrong. They only had one rule. Don't eat that, the fruit of that tree. They didn't know what was good and what was evil. When you become like God, you know what's good and what's evil, what's right and what's wrong, but you also take on the responsibility of being good, not evil. Adam and Eve messed up. You have to lose pride to achieve happiness. Pride destroys happiness in our homes, and it will destroy it in churches. And we need humility in our homes. Too many homes are miserable because of pride. People just cannot admit that they're wrong. It's always somebody else's fault. It's always my husband's fault. It's always my wife's fault. It's somebody else's fault. I never do anything wrong. You are the problem. A young preacher, I read this story a good long while back, and I thought this would be a good place to tell it. A young preacher was going to preach his first sermon. He was well prepared. The day came. The building was full. They wanted to hear this young, dynamic, new preacher preach his first sermon. The pastor introduced him. He walked to the pulpit with pride. He started off good. And then he just went blank. He couldn't think of what to say. It was sad. It was miserable. It was humiliating. The pastor had to take over. And he walked down in humility. Totally defeated and dejected. An old deacon went up to him and said, Son, if you had walked up the way you walked down, you would have walked down the way you walked up. I hope you caught that. Pride will destroy you. Number two, verse six. Happy are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I tried to think of one word other than righteousness that would fit that, and I come up with two words, a holy life. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Psychologists warn you, if you've ever had any psychology classes, or if you happen to go see one for some reason, they will warn you of the terrible price you have to pay for living with guilt. Guilt causes fear, anxiety, having to hide, sneak around, robs you of a pure heart. Guilt, always wondering if I'm going to get caught or when I'm going to get caught. And a lot of people today are trying to live two lives. They're one way when they're with one group and another way when they're with another group. And some people try to live, they, they think they're a whole mob. They just have all kinds of places that they live different kinds of lives. Different things show up. What would it take to make you happy? How many want to be happy? What would it take to make you happy? Well, if I had lots of money, I'd be happy. I doubt it. You know, if a person's got $1,000, they want $2,000. Man's got two million, he wants another million. John D. Rockefeller was asked one time. Now, he, John D. Rockefeller, 
He was one of the wealthiest men on the planet in his day. He built railroads. He was wealthy. And somebody asked him, how much money is enough? His answer said, just one more dollar. Just one more dollar. That was his ambition in life, to get another dollar. Just grab another dollar. What does it take to make you happy? Well, if I had a better position at work or better position at church, I'd probably be happy. And that's not true. You know, the governor's not happy being the governor. He wants to be president. Position and money will never satisfy and make you happy. Now, every honest Christian knows there's no such thing as a perfect person. I've met a lot of wonderful people in my life, but I've never met a perfect person. Preachers are not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not like some preachers stand up here and tell you how good I am and you're supposed to be like me. I stand up here and tell you how bad I am. Don't be like me. I'm probably the most <laughs> imperfect person in the bunch. I'll put it that way. Preachers are not perfect. Deacons are not perfect. Elders are not perfect. Praise and worship singers are not perfect. I need to hear some amen from some praise and worship singers. <laughs> In Psalm 51, David, the sweet singer of Israel, the man after God's own heart, he had sinned and he repented and he cried out, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Make me to hear joy and gladness. David knew that a pure heart was the only way to have a happy life. And he wanted that pure heart back. New Christian. Hadn't been saved just a short time, young man. And he wanted to learn how to pray. So he was always listening to the old deacons as they prayed so he would learn how to pray. Weeks and weeks he went on. Listened intently. He was at every meeting. And one old deacon always ended his prayer the same way. God, clean out the cobwebs in my life. Clean out the cobwebs. Amen. Every time he closed a prayer, that was his closing statement. One evening they were having prayer meeting. And this old deacon was to dismiss the service. And he prayed. He closed his prayer. God, clean out the cobwebs in my life. Clean out the cobwebs. And the young man had been listening for weeks. He said, don't do it, God. Kill that spider. There's just a lot of spiders running around. A lot of Christians today, way too many of them, seem to take great joy in spreading the weakness of other Christians. Why don't you check yourself? Before you condemn anybody else, how's your temper? Is your temper short at home? Why is it we have short tempers with the people we love the most? Is envy a problem? Do you envy the success of others? I mean, if someone gives a testimony of how God blessed them, do you feel envy because God answered their prayer and He doesn't seem to answer yours? Do you speak out loudly if the cashier shortchanges you? Doesn't give you enough money back. 
But you keep your mouth shut and walk out in silence if the cashier gives you back too much money. You better check yourself. Amen. Is your life at home a contradiction to the way you live your life at church? Maybe we better leave this one. Let's move on to the next one. Rule number three, verses seven through nine. Happy are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Be merciful and be a peacemaker. Many Christians have the idea that if they're not doing anything wrong, that just living a good life makes them good people. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the scribe and the Levite passed by and they saw this wounded, bleeding man. They didn't add to his wounds. They didn't kick him as they walked by. But they were religious people. Scribes and, and Levites, they were the religious crowd. They were probably on their way to a Bible study and didn't have time to help the man. Galatians 6.1, Paul told the Galatians, he said, if you see a brother overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest you find yourself being tempted with the same temptation that they fell in. Don't think you are above the trap. You think you're too good to fall into that trap? You better be very, very careful. We need a lot of peacemakers in our homes. We need to show mercy. They just too many homes filled with wars and rumors of wars. Parents fighting, kids rebelling against the parents. Pride makes home a living hell. If you always blame for everything and never take any responsibility for yourself, that makes for a miserable hell on earth life. Churches need peacemakers. Isaiah spoke of the time when the lion and the lamb will lie down together. In a lot of churches today, the people can't even sit together. They got one group that sits on one side and another group sits on the other. They've got churches filled with little clicks, a little click here and a little click there, and a click, click here and a cluck, cluck everywhere. <laughs> I mean, and you can't fit in. Don't ever let that happen here. Amen. You ought to shake hands, give everybody a hug, whether you know them or not. Yes. This. How, how can we expect peace in the world if we can't even have peace in our homes and in our churches? Amen. Let me give you one last thing about being a peacemaker. The greatest peacemaker you will ever be is when you introduce someone to Jesus Christ. Amen. Because you are scripturally, you are reconciling them to God. That means you are making peace between them and God when you introduce someone to Jesus Christ. People want peace. They just don't know where to find it. Let me give you one last one. Verses 10 through 12. Happy are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. Now, that's not being persecuted because you deserve it. It's being persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely, or they lie about you for my sake. Verse 12. 
Rejoice. Get happy. Be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So number four. I tried to look for one word or two words that would best describe these verses. And the only word I could come up with was hope. In the middle of the trials and tests, you've got to have hope. Hope makes you glad. Hope is what keeps the weary mother going. Hope keeps the sick looking for the day when they're going to be well again. Hope. Jesus tells the disciples, He's teaching them a lesson on how to be happy. And he says, hope is essential to happiness. Jesus knew that those who would follow him, I mean take up their cross daily and follow him, be true, committed followers of Jesus Christ, not just Christians in name only, he knew they were going to have a rough road. That they were going to suffer persecution that the life, a godly life, will bring persecution. Paul told the Corinthians, our, our light afflictions, the persecutions that you're going through right now, they just last for a season. The prophets were always in trouble. Not because they were bad men, they were in trouble because they were good men. Isaiah was... Uh, Scourge, Jeremiah was thrown into a well, Zechariah was stoned, Peter was crucified, John was exiled, Paul was beaten three times with 39 stripes, 40 was the limit. He was beaten three times, and one time he was stoned, drug outside the city, left for dead. Jesus said he would send us into the world as sheep among wolves. I think today, church, that the body of Christ suffers more from the sheepishness of the sheep than it does from the wolfishness of the wolves. I think we defeat ourselves. Don't measure your success, your happiness, by what you get down here. But nothing Jesus said ever about being happy, nothing will ever make you happy until you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, then the acceptance of Christ is the beginning of happiness. Jesus said it this way, I am come that your joy might be full.